co-chair of the diversity committee with Dr. Colette Dollarhide. Um, happy Women's History Month. Uh, this month we will have um, our diversity lecture series with Dr. Venus Evan Winters, who is a visiting assistant professor in education policy and qualitative measurement here in the Department of Ed Studies. Um, her research focuses on educational policy analysis, Black women and girls psychosocial development and the, across the lifespan and critical race methodologies. Um, that does not do any justice to her research agenda, so I uh, really encourage you to look at her website as well. We also have, uh, uh, yes, visiting professor, my apologies. Um, we also have Dr. Lori Patton Davis, who is the department chair of educational studies. Her scholarship focuses on African-Americans in higher education, critical race theory, campus diversity initiatives, and girls and women of color in educational and social context. So with that said, I am going to turn it over to our speakers um, to talk with us about Beyond Black Girl Magic, how do we frame Black girls and women in the center of educational research. Thank you all for joining us today. All right. Well, thank you for um, having us. Uh, kudos to you, Kristen and Colette, for leading the, the uh, diversity committee and for um, inviting me and Venus to um, be in conversation with one another today. So don't be fooled by this beautiful presentation. Uh, this really is a conversation and, you know, where appropriate and applicable, feel free to engage with us in the chat. I can't see the chat because I'm working this PowerPoint, but um, uh, definitely feel free to do that. Uh, so the, the title of the presentation is Beyond Black Girl Magic, How Do We Frame Black Girls and Women at the Center of Educational Research? And uh, this is an area that is near and dear to our hearts, um, not only as researchers and scholars, um, but basic, basically who we are. Uh, and this idea around Black girl magic has taken off, and I think it is definitely a testament and a way to celebrate the accomplishments and contributions of uh, Black girls and women. But oftentimes, um, researchers and educators and scholars have a difficult time with framing uh, fl framing Black uh, girls and women in educational research. And so our goal here today is to really share ideas and perspectives from our own work, uh, and then to hear from some of you who um, hopefully are doing some of the same work um, uh, uh, centering uh, Black girls and women. Uh, so uh, the overview is really simple. Uh, Venus and I will share a little bit about ourselves and how we sort of uh, enter into this work. Um, we'll talk about some prevailing uh, myths and uh, how Black girls and women are problematized, uh, share some social political context that sort of uh, fuel of uh, this problematizing, and then um, move into the remainder of the presentation, which is really about how we reimagine research uh, through a Black uh, girl and women-centric lens. Um, and I will advance here. And the rest of our time will be spent with audience engagement. Okay, thank you, Lori, for uh, you know uh, getting us started. Also, thank you, uh, Dr. Christian, for introducing us and having us here, as well as the uh, the social justice uh, diversity. <laughs> I don't know what which committee I'm on at this point, but the diversity uh, committee as well and social justice committee. And it's really interesting because if you hear, I'm on that committee, <laughs> but if you hear some of the conversations that we have. Uh, we're so inclusive and intersectional and we're always problematizing. I think at this point we can have so many acronyms and synonyms to describe us diversity, equity, social justice. I think if anything, <laughs> for sure, everybody that's in, on that committee around that table, we are committed to uh, societal transformation through an equitable uh, lens. So with that said, I I think that uh, for Lori and I, this is where we enter this conversation. Lori said, this is who we is. And I think we're certainly, uh, we're an embodiment of, of how Black 
girls and women, how we live culturally, spiritually, intellectually, and even I would add emotionally, because I know in this space, <laughs> you all probably heard us open up talking about civility. Sometimes emotions is not even allowed in uh, our research conversations, or if it is permitted, it's not something that we speak of uh, up front, you know, uh, boldly and unabashedly. And so Lori and I both into this conversation uh, from a standpoint of being unapologetic when it comes to standing with Black girls, women, femmes, and, and uh, gender non-binary and expensive youth and people. Uh, so with that said, <laughs> uh, I'm teaching currently intersectionality uh, in qualitative inquiry. And I have mostly students of color, even international students. And so now I think about these research methodology questions as it relates to the experiences of black girls and women's epistemologies and ponderings about methodologies differently. Uh, and as you can hear, my tongue is rhythm. <laughs> and I want us to get used to talking about, and this is what I teach my, my graduate students, by the way, I want us to become more comfortable with having conversations around research and science through a culturally informed lens. <laughs> so I want us to become more comfortable having these conversations through a cultural lens um, and not taking on the discourse of the dominating group. And I say that as a black woman, who used to be a black girl and still has a black girl inside of me. So what does this look like from a research perspective? Beyond just teaching uh, research for years, I was what we would call in the field, right? Uh, in many ways, I'm still in the field as a scholar, practitioner, activist. And so when I'm not teaching intersectional qualitative research, I'm also uh, laboring, <laughs> it's emotional labor, uh, movement work labor and intellectual labor uh, partnering with a think tank out of uh, Columbia Law School, the African American Policy Forum. So I spend many of my days understanding how state sanctioned violence impact the, the lived experiences, the, the, the everyday experiences of black girl and black, black black girls and black women. So what does it look like from a policy perspective? What does it look like from a legal perspective? And I think more importantly, how are black women and, and other uh, people who are in the struggle for our humanity having conversations around research. Um, and, and so that's one of my starting points. I also come from, so imagine spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to let us live. Imagine that on a day-to-day -day basis and then going into a university classroom and teaching why it's important to have conversations around race and gender simultaneously. But also I hail from the South side of Chicago uh, I survived the, the, the war against Black people or from a political policy perspective was called the war on drugs and the war on poverty. Um, and, and, and so interestingly enough, you have these intersections of policies that are making Black people's uh, lives uh, not only difficult, but also having us living in less than humane uh, situations as we as we fought or continue to fight for our civil rights as well as human rights, just everyday human rights in this country uh, and beyond these borders as well. And so I'm going to have some of those conversations. Uh, I was influenced by the hip hop generation and as well as my own family's, you know, beliefs in pan Africanism and a strong uh, black identity, a strong black feminine <laughs> identity. On, on top of that, where women were just as, their voices were just as important as the men's voices, but we also understood that men held a lot of the uh, physical um, or material power, uh, if not holding down, you know, the family. So how do I make sense of that in my research pursuits? And how do I make sense of that as I research still alongside Black girls uh, and women? So in a lot of my work, I do center Black girls' experiences as researchers, as in interpreters of, of research and uh, as organizers and social justice act activists. Uh, so Lori, tell us a little bit about how you entered this work and your passion. Um, sorry, I was just so enthralled listening to you. Um, but one of the things that I think is really cool um, is the Illinois connection. So you coming from Chicago, me growing up in East St. Louis, Illinois, and um, understanding what it is to navigate a space like East St. Louis, which I think is often forgotten. Most people don't know what East St. Louis is. They think it's St. Louis. 
Um, but coming from a place like East St. Louis uh, and being able to thrive in a community that Jonathan Kozel, um, mm -hmm. uh frames through a, a, a lens of savage inequalities, right? Um, mm -hmm. So to be able to grow up and thrive in uh, a city that otherwise would, has been forgotten by uh, the state, um, but to be a Black girl growing up there, to experience joy there, um, to have parents in a community that celebrated me um, all the way, you know, uh, until today. And so um, the, coming into this work, I guess, is is fairly easy, right? Because it, it's, it's hard work, but it's also hard work. So it's work that I'm passionate about. And... Um, to go to to come from a place like East St. Louis and then go into post secondary educational environments and be engaged in a curriculum where I never saw myself, um, I think is what really sparked uh, a desire uh, in me to locate. Uh, if you will, Black uh, girls and women in educational research. And I will say from my perspective, uh, since a lot of my work is focused um, within the higher education space, it has been, you know, how, how when we begin to ask research questions, how are uh, Black women positioned, whether they are faculty, how um, institutional leaders, um, if they are undergraduates or graduate students. So beginning to ask these questions because I'm in this field where we're talking specifically about higher education. And I'm like, well, I'm in higher education, but I don't see anything about how people who look like me um, actually make it through, right? Uh, uh, these, you know, different phases of, of higher education. And so that's sort of where, um, uh, a lot of my work has uh, landed uh, uh, Black women and girls in the post-secondary landscape, but they can't get there without um, the support and care uh, that it takes as they're going through girlhood, right, or going through K-12 spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing that's important to, to think about for me and, and, and my positionality is that I although I've spent years doing work uh, in this area, much of that work influences how I lead uh, in the department, how I um, uh, attempt uh, and try in many cases to uh, provide venues and spaces for voice, for um, people who would not typically be leaders to be leaders, like all of these things. It's not just, I do this research here, you know, I do administrative work here, you know, all of who I am um, shows up uh, in my role as a department chair, it shows up in my role as uh, a scholar and researcher, it shows up in my role as someone who is raising um, a Black girl. Um, and so uh, I, I'll stop there, but, um, you know, what you see is what you get, right? There, There is no um, facade, right? Uh, this is just who I am. And so, you know, if you're, if, if someone were to be standing on the outside looking in, trying to Scott describe Lori and who she is as a leader, you can't do that without centering uh, my blackness, my womanness, uh, and various other identities that make me who I am. So um, I am going to advance, but I hope that gives everybody a sense of who Venus and I are. Uh, and I will also just add one thing uh, in terms of uh, Venus and I coming together and ultimately collaborating and me begging her to consider uh, being here at um, Ohio State. Uh, when you're doing this work uh, in, in the field of education, you look for people who get it, right, who understand, um, who, again, share similar passions and who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the work, right, and to challenge structures and, and those sorts of things. And so uh, I am incredibly appreciative of her for even considering coming here. Uh, and for uh, gracing us with uh, her knowledge and expertise. Gratitude. Thank you, Lori. So, dance. Okay. Uh, so, I, you know, don't want to belabor any particular slide, but I think it's important 
um, for us to talk about these prevailing myths uh, uh, that surround uh, Black women and girls and how we ultimately get problematized in particular ways. And so many uh, Black women scholars have talked about these uh, tropes. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins talks about controlling images, but there are these larger framings um, that situate Black girls and women as problems. Uh, some of those stereotypes and tropes include uh, the mammy, um, which is um, his historically uh, a larger black woman and the expectation is that she cares for people uh, uh, and takes care of them uh, more so than herself. Uh, the Sapphire, uh, Sidnithia uh, Fordham uh, wrote an article and I can't remember the year it's been, um, so long now, but she had an article titled Those Loud Black Girls, um, where she talks about how um, loudness and anger are um, uh, uh, characteristics that are mapped onto uh, Black girls and women uh, and being sassy. And so you might see memes. Uh, well, today we see memes. They, there were no memes when uh, significant <laughs> But um, you see these memes where some, you know, someone rolling their neck, you know, and, and being sassy. So that's the, the sapphire uh, trope. Um, the Jezebel. So, you know, a woman not in control of her body, uh, instead sharing her body. Um, and uh, you see that a lot. Um, uh, this, uh, I, uh, controlling image of the Jezebel when you think about videos, for example, uh, and how the body is used, um, or the superwoman, Black women expecting to be all things to all people, um, almost to a point where it's detrimental to her health, right? Um, uh, trying to be the superwoman. Uh, this new model minority um, idea is not necessarily a trope, but I was reading an article some time ago and the author asked, are Black women the new model minority? And uh, the author, he's a sociologist, gave this litany of um, examples where Black women were succeeding, but it was succeeding in comparison to Black men, right? Uh, and so he missed a, a, an important piece in his analyses, but he situated this new model minority to liken it to um, how Asian uh, and Asian American communities are often signified as uh, model minorities. And then the last is Black girl magic. Again, um, uh, when this idea or this hashtag was introduced, the idea was to celebrate Black women and girls, to, to celebrate our accomplishments and contributions, but what gets lost in this larger discourse around uh, Black girl magic is that it's often used to dismiss the tremendous labor that goes into what might feel like magic when you look at it, right? And so it's easy to look at, um, you know, Serena Williams, right, and watch her, um, you know, play tennis and do all of these things and miss everything that went into getting her into that space, right, and uh, the trials, the labor, all of these things. And so these are just some of uh, the stereotypes and tropes, but what's important to, to, think, to think about with any of these tropes is that when Black women face particular predicaments in society, and we're going to talk about social political context, but when they get into those predicaments, they are often blamed for the predicaments or um, uh, or considered to be victimless, right? Um, or to not experience pain. Like there are all of these things that come along with these tropes that make Black women the problem, rather, or make that make Black women and girls the problem, but uh, does not account for structural factors that position Black women uh, to be in problematic situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because, Lori, as I hear you talking about all of these framings, and as you know, many of them have uh, emerged and survived since uh, the enslavement period, and they just stuck with us, right? Mm -hmm. So Mammy, Sapphire, Jezebel, and then we start hearing about the superwoman stereotype in the post-70s, right? Michelle Wallace talked about it extensively uh, in some of her early talks and, and, and writings, and then 
it's interesting because I do work with adolescents and girls. I'm hoping we can recruit some of our college age women here uh, at OSU to continue doing this type of work. Uh, I hear them talking about uh, their fatigue because they they are these stereotypes, these tropes are fate are forced onto them. And as you can see in our next slide, so I want to frame this now through an educational uh, perspective, especially you know being here in the diversity uh, uh, you know space, uh, educational space. It's, it's really interesting because I was just thinking that from a a deficit perspective. Uh, for example, Lori hinted at uh, savage inequalities, right? From a deficit perspective, we spent most of our graduate years talking about the achievement gap, the achievement gap and how black and brown students were compared to white students being left behind uh, or, or behind, you know, standardized tests compared to uh, their white uh, peers. And <laughs> I was never comfortable with that language only because when you began to compare uh, our most invested in students, which is usually white middle class suburban students or uh, higher wealth students from a uh, well resourced school communities when they when we compare them to international uh, scales, they can't even compare right <laughs> so. Uh, then we start to leave that you know that language behind instead of talking about achievement gaps uh, Dr. Um, Lance and Billings she began to rephrase it as educational debt so the debts that we. Uh, owed to to black children, black students, uh, and then uh, in the po the, po the political uh, educational policy studies area, we begin Sykes and at L some other authors. They start talking about opportunity, <laughs> opportunity uh, gaps. And then recently, uh, Ed Claude, a critical race theorist, is rephrasing this even as um, you know opportunity. Uh, what do you call it? He calls opportunity debts, right? So what mm -hmm. our government is not politically invested in as far as Black people's uh, overall welfare, right? Um, and so I start, you know, and then of course, in, in our book, we talk about investing in Black girls and women. Now for me, from a capitalist <laughs> critique, I sometimes don't like, I, I, you know, I kind of take pause when I think about how we use these um, uh, these very uh, economic political terms to describe the state of Black peoples and Black women and girls' welfare. Uh, but it makes sense. So we're talking about how do we invest our time? How do we uh, allocate our resources? How do we reallocate our resources across student groups? And currently in the United States, uh, Black girls, young women, and youth are the most highly disinvested uh, a group of students right now in this country. In fact, I was looking at, I thought about some of you all here, Dr. Ford's research. We're talking about the, uh, you know, the changes to the AP African American Studies curriculum. And so I'm sitting back and my job is to look at some of these uh, discussions from an intersectional perspective, right? Because let's be, let's be clear, androgyny is real. So we would sometimes look at these discussions, African American Studies, we're thinking about it usually from a masculine perspective, to be honest, or we're looking at it from a feminist perspective. Uh, but we're very rarely looking at it from a intersectional perspective. So when I sat back and I just started to look at it, one, speaking of disinvestments, first thing we notice is that uh, approximately out of all students taking advanced placement courses, approximately 9% of those students identify as African-American. So we're talking about segregated curriculum here. But two, if we look at students who are least likely to be uh, selected for AP or gifted education programs, they're more than likely African American and Black girls are the least likely and most likely to be penalized when it comes to AP across behavioral and uh, academic uh, expectations. Meaning, do you think the student would do well? Uh, Black girls are also least likely to um, be recommended for STEM uh, AP courses. Uh, and so, but then if you know anything about this AP, speaking of investments, <laughs> this AP discussion, African American uh, advanced placement uh, courses, what you find is that they're actually gutted out all the black women. So somebody, you know, mm -hmm. it's funny because we got colleagues like Lori here, who they focus on black women in higher education, black women researchers and where we show up and where we pushed out or where we're erased. Well, this curriculum is an example of that. So now we're talking about you are another generation 
of black girls who may be erased and or pushed out of the curriculum altogether because if you have more than 80% or 90%, depending on the school district of people who are in AP, that means we're gonna have another generation of white educators or white leaders, right? Or white uh, holders of wealth who don't even understand the condition of black women and girls. So we're talking about another generation of disinvestment. And this has real life consequences beyond policy and curriculum. Uh, again, black girls are the least likely to be protected. They're more likely than any other gender to come in contact, gender uh, racialized, I should say women's group, of any racial group, to come in contact with police officers on school campuses and in their neighborhoods, such as, you know, 15, 16 year old girls being body slammed by police officers at the pool while they have on their bathing suits, or nine year old black girls who are arrested in cold weather in the snow and, you know, thrown in face first. Uh, in a police squad car simply for having a tantrum when their parent, their caregiver, I think a foster parent told them no, or in the case of Ohio, where a black girl in foster care was shot point blank uh, multiple times by a police officer who wasn't even on the scene for less than 12 seconds. I know because I had to count it. That's a part of my work. <laughs> count how long, how many seconds the police officer was there before implicit bias kicked in and a military trained officer in civilian territory shot a black girl. Uh, our research, uh, research also shows that Black girls are more likely to be survivors of childhood molestation, sexual assault. We just read a really good article in class uh, by Harris that talks about, uh, again, structural failures, institutional failures in higher ed where uh, women of color, young women of color aren't receiving services or aren't considered in conversations around uh, sexual violence on campuses. Um, and also black girls are more likely to be perceived as adult-like. So <laughs> the assumption is that they know more about sex. The assumption is that they are fast or lascivious, meaning that they dress a certain way, they talk a certain way. So therefore they, are, they know too much about sex or other adult content. When the case, again, we got the silico failures, these silico uh, disinvestments, because if they know this much or if they're adult-like, then why, we don't need to protect them. They're not protected. And then we begin uh, to disinvest in them another generation. And also, as many of you all know from uh, the Push Out film, as well as uh, Dr. Monique Morris's book, Push Out. By the way, I was in a documentary. <laughs> Look, this is not this is not a soft sale. But I was in a Push Out film documentary uh, talking about uh, research on the state of Black girls and young women in schools, but also how uh, education often collides with um, mental health and safety of Black girls. And also, check it out, this is a hard sell. Uh, I was also in teaching training, teachers training videos. And so that, uh, I speak like me, but I'm also an avatar. I am. I was put into a cartoon character uh, showing how to disescalate um, situations at schools. And so anyway, I know that was a lot of information, but I think that that information is important uh, Lori and, and, and other folks here, one, some of my grad students are here, so it's my opportunity to teach. Uh, but I, again, it's not just about the discourse, it's how do we use the discourse of research for change? How do we use the language of research to activate real change at the systemic level, the institutional level, as well as at the micro level or interpersonally. So we have to have multiple targets when we're thinking about the social political conditions of black girls and young women. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Venus. And I'll just add, you know, uh, much of what you share trickles into what happens as black girls become women, right? Mm -hmm. This, you know, lack of care continues. And it's not just that black women, um, you know, uh, are undertreated uh, as adults, it happens when they're girls as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is, you know, uh, significant research that suggests, you know, uh, that Black women are uh, chronically undertreated for pain um, and, and that they have a higher mortality rate. Like there's, you know, something happening there uh, and it didn't just happen because they became Black women, but it's more systemic uh, and has, you know, uh, been part of, 
uh, this body of tropes that suggest that Black women don't feel pain, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think the same can also be said just around how Black women get compensated. And I know, um, you know, this information should not be surprising that you know, black women are uh, are not you know paid yet. They are the largest caregivers uh, in their families, whether it's for children or for the elderly. Um, right now, uh, given the larger conversations around student loan debt, black women carry the highest uh, amount of student uh, debt. And so there are all of these uh, issues that I think affect their life trajectory um, and that are important to keep in mind when engaging them uh, and centering them within educational research. So the questions that we ask or what we're trying to explore about, about Black girls and women, those are important, right? I, I don't, and this, this is my positionality coming out here, but we just can't ask any old question about Black girls and women. We need to be asked questions that matter to their well-being, that matter to their lives. Um, mm -hmm. And so I want to transition us here um, to uh, talk more specifically about research or reimagining research through a Black girl or women-centric uh, lens. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, if I can... Um... I think we've touched upon some of this, this reimagining uh, research uh, through a Black girls and women-centric lens. And I, I love you, Laurie, for that language, centric, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think sometimes we begin to get uh, caught up in these, these identity politics. And sometimes if we don't align with those identity politics, we want to shift away from the conversation. But this is just saying we're centering Black girls and women, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so interestingly enough, to, to piggyback on to the, the research, the data that, that Lori just cited, uh, we can go even further, we can dig further. So there's this concept that's called weathering. And, and I'm looking at Lori, I'm looking at Donna, I'm looking at Janice, I'm looking at Rhodesia, and I don't have on my glasses, so I can't see nobody else. Because <laughs> I'm trying to be cute and I can't see Jack. And I got a headache because I can't see. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, let me tell y'all something, okay? And hopefully this will take place uh, next semester, pending time and availability. But I do think, um, so I'm one of those people that I take advantage of, you know, all of OSU resources. So I'm taking my, my little health and wellness plan thing really, really serious. And so my health coach, she's good, okay? And she knows I work hard, <laughs> so I have goals. And um. But I recently found out as a part of my, my research on uh, state sanctioned violence and how do we mitigate and intervene that bl even black women who are highly educated or have more education than their white female peer um, and have higher incomes, they actually have earlier deaths. <laughs> and uh, this is crazy. So we kind of knew that, right? We look at the maternity, uh, the, ma the maternity death rate of, of Black women and uh, Black women who died the first year after childbirth. But we also see this, this concept this in the medical field. I'm also a clinician, by the way, y'all, in private practice. And we see this idea in the clinical spaces called weathering. And this is why I called out y'all names, all the Black women leaders here around this, this uh, Zoom. Uh, there's a concept called weathering. So now new research has found, or it's not new, it's actually coming back to surface, but new, a newer body of research is showing too that Black women are experiencing weathering. Not only women went to, you know, to account for women who have died in childbirth or a year after giving birth, up to a year after giving birth, but also Black women who study issues of inequity, in particular racism, and white supremacy and other forms of inequity have a lower uh, mortality rate, have a higher mortality rate, meaning they pass away at earlier ages. That's something to think about, okay? So I think too that another uh, purpose, another way we can use this research is not only to document the hardships of black women, or I like to say to die, I've been left out alone, that deficit pathology model, but also I say we, we, we're documenting our humanity, mm -hmm. but we also need to learn how to use 
research for purposes of improving our quality of life while also holding governments responsible. These investments that we're talking about, institutions, organizations, governments. And so our welfare plan, right? I love my health and wellness coach, but maybe a part of our health and wellness may be affinity spaces, right? affinity spaces that are specific to black women because there are certain things that I say that I know she's like what does this have to do with health and wellness well I may not want to go to the gym without my scarf on because I want to protect my hair and also it's a sacred thing you know <laughs> it's like I feel more comfortable with my hair is my head is covered not just my hair but my head and that's for spiritual reasons but uh, she may not understand how I may not feel. I feel a certain way, right? This is not just about body image, but how I feel a certain way when I'm around, you know, people who are not Black, right? I'm just more protective. And so maybe we had these infinity spaces where those of us who do race work, we can also uh, have uh, spaces where we can unwind too while taking care of our health. And so, uh, so let's talk about that. That's just one example of reimagining, right? So maybe as a part of the diversity committee, we have a wellness committee. We walk or whatever. I don't know. Uh, the way we think about when we're studying these hard topics, you know, such as Sam Mackay O'Brien shot multiple, you know, fifty-year-old girls shot multiple times by an adult male, or girls being slammed to the ground. Maybe we need to think about how can we use our research for healing. So that's some of the conversation. I'm hoping that you all use the chat. Take advantage of the chat to raise these questions uh, to myself and Lori. Okay, so uh, in this slide here, uh, what does it mean to center Black girls and women in educational research? One, it has to be more inclusive. So you may have heard me say Black girls, Black women, uh, uh, gender expansive youth, gender non-binary youth. So how can we be more inclusive uh, our theoretical frameworks? Even, you know, I was uh, Angela Davis, I always revisit uh, freedom is a constant struggle. Freedom is a constant struggle because <laughs> sometimes I do want to give up. Like I should just be talking about research and not giving a damn because that's like a privilege that our peers have. And I'm like, dang, they can distance themselves from their research. Whereas every time I come up with a research question or a theoretical question, it brings me back to uh, this, the condition of Black people in this country, and African people across the diaspora. So that that objectivity, that distance, uh, it's a privilege. Uh, but how can we be more inclusive? How can our, our research uh, centric, that centers Black girls and women, how can it be more critically conscious? What are some strategies that we can use? Uh, also, we must exercise reflexivity. I think that Lori and I, we're very upfront about uh, our, our uh, politics and everybody has politics. To be human is to have politics, whether they're micro politics or macro politics, we are. Our bodies are political. Uh, how we wear our hair, how we speak, which languages we choose to speak when doing presentations like this. Uh, that That's a part of critical reflexivity for human growth. Um, and also, uh, how do you know? How can we bring to the forefront our own racial and gender biases in the in the research process? And how can we challenge uh, gender and racial uh, bias in our research methodologies and and uh, pursuits? Um, okay. So just and and start thinking about some of that. Drop some of your comments or questions in the chat because this is supposed to be a discussion. We didn't want to come here and just talk at y'all because we'll be just the opposite of decolonizing our research conversations. Um. So you know this whole idea around framing. This is just a sampling of some theories. Um. Uh. That and and conceptual models that might be used in research it is by no means um, the extent of it. But I think when we're uh, working to frame research uh, that's inclusive of all, you know, Black girls and women, uh, it's important that that framework, uh, have, you know, have a, a, a critical uh, standpoint, right, that we can ask questions, that we can frame things in a way that captures issues around identity or that captures, you know, particular uh, um, political context that captures, you know, issues around gender. It can be a number of things, but thinking about models, theories, frameworks, I mean, it's nice if 
um, a, a study uh, references black feminist thought, but every study on black girls and women does not have to have black feminist thought. But this <laughs> is just uh, an example of some of the theories. Um, we invite you to, uh, if you are doing work that centers black women and girls, to share some of those theories, um, you know, in the chat box as well. But this, but these are the types of theories. This is what we mean when we talk about appropriate framing to help sort of guide a researcher to be thinking about um, uh, uh, what it means to place Black girls and women at the center. And a lot of these frameworks start off in terms, uh, um, they began with um, a historical framing, right? Acknowledging, you know, issues around tropes, acknowledging issues related to stereotypes, uh, acknowledging uh, patriarchal structures and so forth. And so I think that's really important when we're doing work that uh, specifically centers uh, Black girls and women in research. And we have like three minutes left, so I'm not going to go over uh, this next slide, but I want to, what I do want to say, take, you can take a picture or watch the video later, but <laughs> something that I to, always told my brothers when I was a younger woman and they were younger men, if you want to take care of the babies, take care of the mothers. If you want to take care of the babies, take care of the mothers. So when you all are thinking about your research questions, frameworks, uh, how we cite our literature, who we're deciding to cite, cite Black women and take care of Black women scholars and demand that your institutions, your departments, and that your governments do as well, okay? Because uh, we can't, we can, yeah, so anyway. Um, and, and Laura, you want to wrap us up? Is that okay? I see now yes. we have two minutes left. <laughs> okay. Uh, this slide is really just some questions. We talk, we've talked about reflexivity and positionality throughout, but these are just some of the questions um, that I try to, you know, ask when I'm engaging in this work. I don't think just because uh, I'm a Black woman that I know everything there is to know. I mean, I think uh, uh, Black women's lives are too dynamic and expansive, right, for me to think I know everything. And so mm -hmm. these are just some of the questions that I think it's important to be asking uh, when we think about reflexivity and positionality. And so we have 15 minutes left and we are going to close uh, the presentation part and uh, invite you all to engage in dialogue with us. And I'm sorry, I, I'm looking at three different screens so it doesn't look like I'm looking at you, but I really can see you. Um, but uh, I am just going to open the floor up. Are there questions or thoughts or contributions from those of you who are joining us today? I had a comment. Okay. This I enjoyed the presentation. And so, Lori, when you you know giving the examples of the different tropes, tropes, and then you talked about pain. I mean, that that is real, the um, under-medicating of Black women and maybe Black people, not just Black women, but Black people overall. So I had this, had this serious illness a few years ago. I was hospitalized mm -hmm. and I was just in pain. I kept bringing that little bell, like, give me more medicine. Mm -hmm. They just wouldn't do it. And I kept saying, just give me, the me give me more medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. anyway, to be brief, um, the, the doctor gave me this medicine. I said, it's not, that amount is not working. So I said, you know what, pretend like I'm a white woman and give me some medication. And I've, I've been fine ever since <laughs> I, that medication was doubled and I am very serious. Give me the medicine for white women. Yeah, so research also shows another part of the research. I do have to think tank. Research also shows that uh, Black women are least likely uh, to be given a uh, pain medication to help with pain management. And that's because of what, what uh, Dr. Patton just cited, which is which is that um, black that doctors tend it's like a, it comes from in the enslavement period where doctors believe that uh, black people, uh, could just take on more pain. Black women, you know, uh, didn't feel pain. And that's when they used to use science, you know, in the name of science to experiment on Black women's bodies. As I like to say, the African person, Black people in America, we are the most experimented on human group ever. We have been studied from our toenails to our hair follicles to the tip of our penises. Well, I don't have a penis, but to the tip of penises 
And that's for real. That is science. That is science. And it's not to be vulgar. Mm -hmm. It's perspective, especially with our grad students, to see how we can use science to do harm. And we, we continue in many ways. Now it's more discursive. And, you know, that's, that's another conversation that we should be having. Uh, I like to tell some of my students, I have a lot of international students. I have students who are first in their families to go to college. I, I believe, uh, you know, Lori, that a lot of our grad students are triggered by research. And mm -hmm. I mean, our research language, the marginalization of how we talk about research. They're, they are triggered by when their faculty or, or advisors uh, don't know how to have interconversations about the research they want to pursue, that is triggering. So how are we going to even take care of the Black women, the young Black women and femmes who are choosing to do, you know, Black girl-centered, women-centered work? Well, I think you raised uh, a really good point um, uh, with that and, and that there is something to be said and I've experienced this uh when I was a graduate student you know wanting to do work uh that centered on uh black women in college but you know hearing from some faculty that that wasn't a, an important topic like you know it just they didn't think they didn't understand what the significance of it would be you know and how do you you know how do you respond to you know, an advisor or, um, you know, someone who apparently, you know, clearly has a research, you know, agenda and has been doing this for a very long time to then tell you that your work isn't important. Um, I experienced it, you know, in trying to publish, you know, books mm -hmm. uh, related to um uh specifically you know black women and girls and being told well you should expand this you should really you know i think you'll get more of an audience with women of color or you know mm -hmm. maybe you you should focus on um black men and i'm like either of those topics is worthy of study right like mm -hmm. uh i'm not here to say what's worthy or not worthy but this is the project that i'm trying to do and you know i've sort of outlined in this entire book proposal why I think this is important and who I think the audiences are for, you know, or uh, the audience would be for this sort of project. And what I found um, consistently is that there's this uh, expectation of convincing, you know, okay. and um, I think it's okay um, for those of you on this call who are wanting to do this re research, it's okay to walk away from a publisher or a journal or, you know, reviewer number two who says, I don't understand this question. I don't understand the direction of, you know, it's okay to walk away. And that's not advice that I receive. It's always reviewer you know. number two. Buddy. Right. <laughs> reviewer number two is just really bad. But anyway, you know, um, people who, because they don't understand, diminish the, the value of it. And I and, and what you will see in a lot of um, scholarship related to Black girls and women is the use of poetry or uh, mm -hmm. the use of music. Uh, uh, I was able to contribute, uh, uh, Venus and um, several other scholars uh, co-edited uh, the Lauren Hill Reader, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are all of these... Um, uh, cultural pieces uh, that shape how Black girls and women navigate, right? And mm -hmm. if you were to interview them and ask them, well, you know, you know, how, how does this song feel or you know, feel to you? Or how does it make you feel? Or how does this music make you feel? You know, these sorts of things, it shapes mm -hmm. our outlook, right? It shapes how we think about things. And so those are inherently significant for the research process but there and are I think too to your point from a diversity and equity perspective mm -hmm. I, I think the other challenge that we have is the assumption is that our audience is always white the assumption mm -hmm. is the reader is white so we're spending although we've done a lot you know and I'm I'm, I'm definitely a beneficiary <laughs> Of the Black Civil Rights Movement, Affirmative Action, and the Women's Movement. I'll say that, the feminist movement. I'm a beneficiary. And we've done a lot over the last 20, 25 years to recruit more Black women into higher ed. We've done a lot to recruit more students of color, people of color, into higher ed. But what we have not done is we have not invested in a paradigm shift. 
where the assumption is that if you see any of these people of color, any of these women, any of our international students writing, the assumption is not that we're trying to change the minds or behaviors of white people. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to do, again, citing September P. Clark, Paulo Freire, right, and Gwendolyn Brooks, what we are trying to do and what we are called to do, what we have a moral and ethical responsibility to do is to conduct research for our communities. That's the only obligation we have. So the assumption should be that the reader is my grandmother, your cousin, your brother, and your sister and maybe a government official who can shape policy. And we all can shape policy in our local, and our starting with our communities and home base, period. Mm -hmm. uh, Donna? Okay, yeah, I um, was also thinking about um, this notion of being, so this came from something you were saying, Venus, uh, this notion of black women being uh, blacked out because so much, uh, substantially more or disproportionately more work is on black males so we're blacked out and then when they talk about women even like women's history month we, we're not given a high uh, status so we're being um, whited out in that way so Venus I know you wrote on that and mm -hmm. then I wrote on that you were on that not too long ago and then um, Tanya Middleton and I have written about it as well so blacked out and whited out and uh, so this presentation is so important to make us be seen and heard. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Kristen? There we go, thank you. I had to, I ate my lunch, so I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I really appreciate everything that you all have shared. And something that I've been grappling with lately is that um, I was never engulfed in feminist work um, because of my experiences as an undergraduate with women and gender studies. I said, oh, this is not the place for me. And so only recently has my research and my personal life, I feel like has been calling me to like Black feminist theory and critical race feminism. And I'm wondering, um, and so I'm doing a lot of readings just personally, not even professionally, but even my research, um, my participants has largely been Black women, even though it's been open to everyone and their experiences are unique. I'm wondering what tools or strategies you all use um, as you conduct your research and your practices to engage with this topic because you are not removed emotionally um, from your work. Mm -hmm. Um. Let, I want to make sure I understand. You want to know how do we engage in the work given that we are not removed from it emotionally? Is that correct? Yes. So how do you engage deeply in your research uh, generally with the topic and the, the uh, mm -hmm. participants, right? The sample, because you are not, you know, don't have a distance from it. Oh, I think that's one of the benefits of the work. Mm -hmm. Um Again, you know, it, it goes, for me, it goes back to positionality and reflexivity. So what, what is it about me and how I've walked in this world as a Black girl or a Black woman that becomes relatable for someone who is engaging in the research, research process with me? Um, but also the reflexivity, I don't know everything. So what, what still is there to be learned or that can be a contribution or that can make her feel like, you know, she is contributing to you know, the, the work that, you know, we're doing. That's how I think about it. And um, I, whether you're doing quantitative, qualitative mixed methods, I think positionality and reflexivity is just so important, right? Um, again, how are you showing up in the research? So I, I think it's okay to be close uh, to the participant or whatever, their lives, but the you have to draw a space so that you know if it's about them then you got to let the work be about them not what you think the work should be because um you're asking because they're at the center of it right so that's sort of how I navigate or maneuver you know in research just to be thoughtful and conscious about the fact that sure there are some things I know um I know them to be true for myself but I don't make the assumption that 
Black women and girls are some monolith, right? Um, and I'm op very much open to, you know, what's different or, you know, what learning can occur uh, when I'm engaging with participants in, in research. Mm -hmm. and, and Kristen, <laughs> just because again, the graduate, sometimes the graduate students remind me of something I said, I honestly don't remember, but in, in the book, Black Feminism and Qualitative Inquiry, I saw Colette, thanks for telling us to drop our, you know, uh, books. And so it's a slide that Lori's going to put back up before we go. But Kristen, okay. I do recommend Black Feminism and Qualitative Inquiry, just because I send the reader on a journey. I talk about how I came to Black feminism because my grandmother, she embodied Black feminisms, whereas it was a white woman who introduced me to the term feminism, okay? And so politically, I'm aligned with this, this very academic concept called Black feminism. Uh, however, how I live my life uh, is an embodiment of Black women's knowledge and wisdom. And so sometimes, again, uh, white people don't own science. We have to get that out of our heads. Uh, in fact, one of the first universities was in Timbuktu, which is an, an, an African uh, you know, institution, one of the oldest <laughs> African institutions in Timbuktu. Uh, but keep in mind that indigenous people, I'm thinking of even Linda Twai right now, uh, work. We use science in a way that we were trying to figure out how to be more harmonious with the land. When we studied the skies, we wanted to know how do we communicate with higher spirits or God. When we studied the land, it wasn't to conquer or to colonize people. It was to understand how can we grow abundantly for, for us and the animals, for plant life. And so we even had this concern with, with the environment. Uh, but <laughs> when you're this close to your research, Historically, uh, you know, in, in colonial research practices, the colonizers' research, they were going out to figure out how to conquest. They were trying to figure out how to control. Uh, and, but what happens when those of us who are entering the institutions now, you know, during not only a health pandemic, but also a racial pandemic? Uh, you know, how do we heal when we're studying these research topics and peoples and communities and contexts and, and liberatory uh, practices? And in that book, I talk about indigenous ways of knowing and healing, right? And I'll just give, because we have, like I said, we got grad students here. I just took a call from my grad students, international students. They're missing home. They're missing their healing spaces when they're, you know, dealing with these triggers and traumas. Uh, I am a big fan of what we call in research, critical reflexivity. Well, in healing spaces, we refer to that as journaling, <laughs> right? We talk about sitting with your data in healing spaces. We, we call that meditation, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, you know, you can do those things. What we call methodological processes and healing spaces, wisdom spaces, you know, we refer to that as ritual work. Um, and, and so this is why we also have to decolonize the language of research. You know, what some people call ethnography, I call it being a nosy neighbor. So it depends. <laughs> so those are some practical tools on how to be with your data in meaningful ways that are sacred to you and your participants. Or as you're thinking through Black feminist thought and other Black women's knowledge bases, um, Think of it as an opportunity uh, for consciousness raising uh, where you can evolve, uh, not just intellectually, but also spiritually and culturally. Um, yeah. I know we're at one o'clock. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you all engaging with us today and thank you all, um, the attendees for your attendance and attention. Uh, this will be posted on our website. And so if you would like to revisit this, um, it'll be available there as well as downloading the slides from the chat. Um, so with that being said, you all have yourself the most amazing week. Um, enjoy the sunshine if you are in the Columbus area. And I hope to see you next month for our next diversity lecture series. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everybody.